So what's the background behind this talk? Well, as all good students of theosophical literature, you will know, we can often pour through the words that are, have been given to us uh, from the masters in whichever way they come through, whichever the agent, um, in this case, um, uh, the celebrated Madame Blavatsky. And sometimes, depending on our own course of study this year, depending on our past life involvement with the wisdom, there will be certain things that stand out to us and resonate, and yet there will be a mystery behind them. And I've picked four nuggets, and I shall give you the detailed references from the three uh, volumes of The Secret Doctrine, which have held my attention to the extent that I've wanted to use them as a seed thought to get deeper down. And therefore, they have been the result over many years, I might say, uh, of um, contemplative activity, where the thought doesn't just go in a linear fashion from A to B to C, but it kind of circles around a point of consciousness, which is embedded in the seed thought itself. And what has come out of this has been quite rigorously analysed by the concrete mind. So we have here, I would suggest, a mix of intuition and intellect. And therefore, a lot of it is suggestive. But it's suggestive to the extent that I'm hoping that with some of the nuggets, you can pick up and your intuition will give you a nod of the head or that's worth pondering further on. And there is a, a symbolic diagrammatic sheet, which I can provide to people uh, after the talk by email, if they so wish. It actually forms the template of my talk tonight. So there's no words, just these pictures, which I'm going to describe. And each time I do this, I describe them slightly differently. So that's the idea of what we're going to do. And um, uh, some nuggets will be a little bit longer than the other. Um, so we'll get into the first one. So I'm going to give you the reference if you are interested. It's going to be recorded. So we'll have it there. Um, I am using for um, uh, Secret Doctrine Volumes 1 and 2 the Centennial Edition. Um, and in particular, the first nugget. Uh, from volume one, Cosmogenesis, page 70. And I find this possibly the deepest of them all. I'm going to read you out the nugget straight from the secret doctrine, and then I'm going to go through uh, uh, the, the, the deeper understanding that, that, that has emerged for myself uh, and throw it uh, open to maybe discussion at the end. So, H.B. Blee says, according to the tenets of Eastern occultism, the darkness is the one true actuality. The basis and the root of light, without which the latter light could never manifest itself or even exist. Light is matter and darkness pure spirit. Darkness in its radical metaphysical basis is subjective and absolute light, whilst the latter in all its seeming effulgence and glory is merely a mass of shadows as it can never be eternal and is simply an illusion or maya. And I think of the number of talks I've been to that talks about the light on the path, the light of the soul. And this light is given such great glory in the, the teachings by so many different proponents of it. But Madame Blavatsky is here, it's not even hinting, it's stating very clearly, it is not the one true actuality. And that fascinated me. And so I started to put together this idea that we have to look much further than uh, the human being in its personality and the soul, because the soul itself uh, is corresponding to light and often the personality until illumined by the light of the soul can be seen to be either not yet on the path or if we're starting to take in degrees of some kind of illumination on the path, but not yet 
fully um, soul infused. But we are aware, thanks to the work of the uh, um, pioneering theosophists, uh, of the existence of the monad. And I would suggest that we need some symbols here uh, so that we can get the scheme of evolution uh, in our minds. And the symbols would be um, uh, the earth, which is a circle with a cross in it, representing the earthly mundane personality, the human being with all its human frailties and, of course, um, uh, ability to be adaptive and to be creative. And then the sun would be the symbol of the soul. And so we bring in light here fairly early on. And in fact, it is clear that the, the, the soul itself um, is an agent for the higher forms of evolution. And immediately with a Christian background, it comes to my mind uh, the saying of Jesus in the New Testament that no one sees the Father except through me. And that was Christ talking. And in this idea of the human being and the earth, we have the idea of the soul being light, and that would be the second aspect or the Christ aspect. And then we have the monad, which I suggest is the father aspect. And if we believe that the great uh, line of evolution is between the personality and the monad, or it, the human being and my father in heaven, we can't get there if we take Jesus's words without the light of Christianity. And so the darkness that we often talk about as being darkness is that darkness which relates to the unillumined personality or to put it in more christian terms the unredeemed personality and that unredeemed personality needs the light of the soul the light of the christ in order for it to link upwards to the monad and if we read a e. powell's wonderful book the causal body and the ego, this is set out quite clearly. It's set out in the, in the fact that we, as we move towards the third initiation, this human personality has to be fully enlightened. But it's not the end of the story because we have to then relate with a soul infused consciousness, we have to relate to the monad. And I'm using in this symbology of earth, sun, I'm using black hole and some people commenting, some writers commenting uh, on the idea of a black hole having some spiritual significance uh, fits very well with my own uh, uh, inner understanding that this is an area of great darkness. And I believe is a very good symbol for the uh, spiritual darkness that HBB was talking about uh, in the nugget. But it goes further than that, uh, because if we consider uh, that we have three circles, which all have the same base, a small circle would be form, and that would relate to the earth. A larger circle with the same base around it would be light this would relate to the soul and then an even larger circle which would be darkness and so when we consider darkness in the way that madame Vlatsky is asking us to this is the pure subjective state of uh, coming out of the dark it would be uh, in the kabbalah speak it would be um Ein Sof Or, where we have the uh, coming into manifestation at Ketha, the crown, but coming into manifestation out of the great unmanifest. And in fact, Nugget 3 also deals with this. But there are some further correspondences I would like to point out that we have now in science emerging the ideas of a dark matter and dark energy. 
And it would seem from my understanding of what scientists are saying is dark matter holds the universe together. It confines and limits energy into form so that we can have a manifested universe. Dark energy works in the reverse way and is causing the universe to expand, expand, expand. And this fits beautifully into the astrological paradigm represented by the planets Saturn and Uranus. Now, Saturn is mightily important in all of our lives because it, uh, it, it governs the cycles of karma. And these cycles of karma, which particularly through the transiting chart, uh, come every 29 and a half years. And so the first return at almost 30 years. The second return, if we make it there, will be almost 60 years. And, and then on to 90. And in fact, if we get over the first two rounds of Saturn, uh, then it can be very, very useful in propelling us uh, uh, into old, old age, where we could become a good teacher uh, to, to, to those who, who, who need it and the generations below us. But up to the age of 59, at least, Saturn is confining. And it's confining because of our karma, generally speaking, the planet and individuals that live on the planet, we have difficult karma. And it's a mountain to climb, but it's the same mountain of initiation as well, as we will come to in Nugget 2. But for now, if we consider uh, that this confining Saturn is, is the planet that almost certainly is corresponding to dark matter, and it keeps us and the universe in form. And it is only when we are illumined by what I would say is the best guide of all, and that will be the light of Christianity, Jesus gave us the opportunity to understand what we need to become as people, acting, living, feeling, loving in the world. He gave us that opportunity to and set the prototype for how to become illumined and we have to throw away an awful lot of stuff not just in this lifetime but in things that we bring through psychologically from the previous lives but having got to that stage uh, and i want to elaborate this more in nugget two because there is a, a continuum between them as it happens as you put them together is that the idea is that when we have got a personality that's been put together an integrated personality. It is a personality that can think without being saturated with emotion, as people's thinking often is. Think to the extent that they can put an idea together on a mental plane. Use the emotions creatively to vivify that thought form with life energy. That's the use of the emotion, not going outward into the world in some attaching way, but being turned creatively inwards to vivify the thought form. And then with the degree of order and organization, give that vivified thought form some uh, life in the physical world, give it some legs so it can manifest in the physical world. That's an integrated personality. And it's part of Saturn's job to do that and i see this on a daily basis in the charts that i read but at the same time we are also able to pay off our karma it's always two sides to the coin with the paying off of difficult karma comes the opportunity to integrate the personality further until when it is fully integrated we can pass the door the doorkeeper of saturn and the higher synthesizer is Uranus. And Uranus is, in any school of astrology, the opportunity for freedom. We don't get that opportunity to fr for freedom until we've addressed our karma. And so the correspondence falls again quite easily, uh, as I see it, that dark energy will be ruled by Uranus. And I've set all this out on the sheet if, if you should request it. And then I can take it a little bit further and say, um, we have uh, in the science of physics, we have the idea of centripetal and centrifugal force. Centripetal brings things to the center. And I call 
uh, a cosmic Saturnian principle, centripetal, pulls things towards the centre and therefore confines and limits, which is what form and matter do for a spiritual reason, but it's still confining and it's still limiting. However, um, Uranus, co co cosmic Uranian principle is centrifugal and centrifugal force causes things to fly outwards. And this is the freedom, the freedom from the known, the freedom from the known. And at some case, at some point in some lifetime, in some situation, we're going to have to dare to go into the unknown. And we're going to have to trust uh, in the energy of Uranus uh, taking us there. So that covers the first nugget, except to just uh, perhaps reiterate that there are two darknesses, as I understand it. There is the darkness of the unilluminated personality, which requires the light of the soul, the light of the angel of the presence, the light of, the, I would say, most practically, the Christ teachings, until that personality is sufficiently illumined and on a parallel track, sufficiently free of karma, to have climbed the mountain, which starts off very broad and very, very difficult as the foothills turn into a slope, the mountain of karma, that we are all sometimes cause us almost to maybe give up on the spiritual goal because the karma can be so tough. And you think of the likes of um, uh, Stephen Hawking and you think, well, Actually, maybe the karma for us isn't quite so tough when someone is serving through science and uh, uh, through the fifth ray of concrete knowledge and analytical science, the planet in the way that he did. Maybe it's an extreme example, but it's a very clear example to me. So this idea of the lower darkness, of which so much has been written, as I alluded to in the opening sentences, but now, as we come to the higher darkness, this is a darkness which Madame Blavatsky is saying is the root of, uh, uh, of all light and is corresponding to the monad. But we just can't go from personality to monad. We have to go through the mechanism of the soul, which I believe is identical with the Christ principle. And if we don't understand the Christ principle in all of its fullness we won't be complete enough it's just my view we won't be complete enough to make the journey because this middle uh, principle is absolutely required but it's not the final goal the monad is okay i'm going to swiftly move on uh, bearing in mind my stated hour and the fact that i'd like um uh, some observations if possible nugget two comes from volume two anthropogenesis uh page 233. And this one jumped out at me because I often refer to Saturn, uh, as I have just before, as the doorkeeper, but I'd never seen it in the secret doctrine prior to reading this nugget. And it's lovely when these things, of course, we don't view a synthesis, we have to put all these things together for ourselves um, and, 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 and take the splinters and the fractions and put them together. But it's always nice when you recognise um, something like this. Um, as something that you speak about to people in their lives. Uh, and, and the quote on two, page 233 is, Saturn is the doorkeeper of the temple of the king. He standeth in Solomon's porch. He holdeth the key of the sanctuary that no man can enter into therein, save the anointed having the arcanum of Hermes. And so this takes a little bit of, uh, initially, um, contemplation. And I want to expand, really, uh, and take further some of the points from Nugget One. And so Saturn is the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper to when and to what? Well, quite clearly, as we'll see in the fourth Nugget, um, this is the doorkeeper up to the third initiation. And just to remember, if we can, um, that the second initiation is very much to do with the emotions and water and is Jesus's baptism in the New Testament. The third 
initiation said to be uh, the transfiguration on the Mount of Olives is that where the human being has turned towards the divine and is not going to welch on the deal and go backward and go back. But in doing that, the karma has been expunged. Saturn, we cannot become, as I understand it, a third degree initiate until we have finished with Saturn. And that's the doorkeeper. The door through to the sanctuary is the door from the third initiation and out of human existence, primarily and centrally, to bring us through to evolution in the kingdom of souls, or as Alice Bailey would call it, the hierarchy. The, uh, the kingdom of souls, the fifth kingdom after the fourth kingdom uh, of, of humanity. And also in reaching the third initiation, and this is where this uh, um, the redemption of matter through Christianity comes in, we talk about the dweller on the threshold of consciousness. And at another point in her writings, Madame Blavatsky said, when we're on the path of return, the path of discipleship, all that is good in you and all that is bad in you comes to the surface. And we have to deal with that as the dweller on the threshold, as a corporate thing, our fears, our desires to stay material, to stay personality, to stay somewhat selfish, to, 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 to live our life according to the way we think uh, it should live and what gives us the maximum satisfaction. And so for those of us on the path of discipleship, we get the stuff thrown at us as the closet is opened and the demons come out at us. And I know from a very personal point of view, um, when I faced some of these demons in the last 10 or so years, more lately rather than earlier, I've been asked about survival, about physical survival, and that it cannot be that you can be a candidate for the third initiation whilst you have and harbour serious survival fears or uh, a desire not to face death, physical death, that is. Uh, because it seems that at the third initiation that we have to open up our hearts and that means use our energies uh, for the good of others rather than trying to keep ourselves alive for a little bit longer with insurance or uh, uh, overly concerned about uh, health matters or whatever it be. Um, we've got a lot of wisdom by the time we've reached the point for the third initiation, uh, I think it's safe to assume, and we must not allow uh, the personality to intrude to any kind of extent at all, otherwise we're not in that position of selflessness that the Christ talked about and gave us his example uh, for as well. And so this idea of Saturn at the doorkeeper, Saturn is going to watch us very carefully and it's not going to let us through this door into the third initiation until we have dealt with our survival fears. And the dweller very much thrives on these survival fears. Um, and uh, part of the um, uh, attrition of the dweller that we're required to go through will only come when we don't have that fear. And so we now get a picture of the fact that when we do go through the, the door, what does the scene look like? And again, uh, diagrammatically, we could see a green mountain, just a peak like that, green mountain. And that green mountain at the bottom will be karma and at the top will be initiation, specifically the third. And coming out of that blue peak, uh, there would, uh, that green peak, there will be a blue cross, transfiguration. This is the cross of Christ, and it is the crucifixion upon the mountaintop. It can be seen as Golgotha, of course, but it is essentially the personality crucified for the higher good. And it's at that point when we are on that cross, we call it the, the, uh, the, um, the cardinal cross in astrology, where we have Aries opposite Libra and Capricorn, the sign of the third initiation uh, opposite Cancer, uh, we get the lightning flash. And that lightning flash comes down and it hits the top of the uh, uh, of the cross. And we are complete as an energy system. And that's the problem with us at the moment. As I see it, we're not complete as an energy system. We're somewhere on that mountain. 
climbing up in the green, and that's humanity. And we get to the blue and that's hierarchy, and we get to the red and that's Shambhala. So Shambhala, where the will of God is known, hierarchy where uh, the love of God is expressed, and uh, the mountain which we're climbing as human beings. And I think if we don't see this synthetic picture, if we can't see uh, that there is a, some... Uh, the fullness of the story, and I quite like that. I call it a pictogram. I quite like that. Uh, and it was given to me in the meditation of the red lightning flash, the blue cross, and the uh, the green top of the mountain. And uh, along with that red flash, we get Uranus, said to be the lightning flash, because Uranus is essentially the first ray of will and power, which is the red uh, 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 of the uh, the color of Shambhala and where, where the will of God is known. But it's also seventh ray as well. And seventh ray is ushering in the age of Aquarius. And we're going to be exhorted to climb even harder, more enduringly up the mountaintop so we can, Christ-like, give the personality up to the greater good and then receive what is called the life energy. You see, there is life, consciousness and form. And this is the correspondence to these three colors, life, red, to do with the monad, to do with the will energy, uh, consciousness, blue, to do with the Christ energy, the soul, and then humanity's own creative energy, which is what we do uh, in climbing that mountain, A, to pay off our karma, and at the same time, to reach the point of initiation by in dismantling our dweller on the threshold, we are able to uh, free ourselves for the lightning flash. So just to recap then, Uranus has the power to release us into freedom. Saturn has done its work when we get to the top of the mountain. And at the top of the mountain, we are ready for release into the world of souls and to be touched by spiritual fire. Now I know some people who have, and it's illustrated astrologically as well, there may be people listening to this talk tonight who've re received a touch of that fire without having to make the full journey up the mountain. And again, it's been intimated to me uh, through the symbols in the, these people's charts that every now and then we can get a helping hand where we are energized by something very, very clearly comes from within and we're set upon a path and propelled along that path to a certain, it's a helping hand where we're given a touch of this fire of the monad, just to make sure the personality doesn't get too sluggish. And it comes right the way through on that vertical arm. It comes right the way through to us as personalities. And we would register it as some initiative or giving us some incentive to do any. These are, these are what's known as the lesser initiations, um, but, but they do happen and they frequently happen uh, uh, with the um, astrological um, touching by the moon of the earth. And that's the circle with the cross in it that I used for the personality before. OK, um, I want to move on to um, a shorter nugget here. Um, is the uh, oh, I'm just picking up. Um, uh, so, uh, something on the chat, and it's so relevant that I want to comment on it. Thank you, um, Teresa. Yes, abs absolutely. St. Paul, uh, on the road to Damascus, having vilified Christians in the past, uh, had the lightning flash hit him, and it changed him for all time. I would say, and it's my suggestion, uh, that very importantly, with St. Paul, that was the third initiation because it lasted for the rest of his life. But here's a little interesting aside for you, and I thank you uh, for, for bringing that up. And that is that I'm doing some inner work at the moment, which is related to uh, uh, the fifth ray ashram, and the master is Hilarion, and the sixth ray ashram, and the master is Jesus. And this is very much inner work that I'm doing. What's been explained to me is that there is a great link between these two ashrams coming into the age of Aquarius. And I'll explain to you briefly uh, in objective terms what the link is. And it's to do with St. Paul. St. Paul wrote those letters in the New Testament and he was as devout a Christian as he could possibly be. 
And yet at the end of his life, he was told one more life, one more life to pay off that horrific karma in your early days. So it wasn't like all the good that he'd done as St. Paul after the lightning flash experience on Damascus. He'd had past history like we all have. And that's, I say great being, but that being who was so instrumental in planting Christianity on the earth actually was able to uh, have this life as Hilarion. And as Hilarion, he lived a different life, but it was his last life. And he's now gone on to be master of the fifth ray of concrete knowledge and analytical science. So from someone who was working on the fourth ray, uh, sorry, the sixth ray of devotion and idealism for so much of it, and in such an intense way, we can see that these ashrams are going to be working together uh, in the age of Aquarius because he has now gone over to science and people say science and religion there is a wonderful overlap between the two i seem to be privileged enough to get be getting insights into both the devotional side of things through my increasing interest in the importance of christianity and the scientific side which i think i'm fairly well uh, um, uh, known to with my fifth ray mind which helps me with my astrology thank you very much for that Teresa. really really good uh, interjection there. So nugget number three, nugget number three will come from uh, volume two of Anthropogenesis, the same volume as the last nugget. Um, it's just one sentence on page 449. Uh, this is, um, the, the quote is, it is the ever becoming, though the never manifesting. And these kind of Zen type riddles, I used to think, didn't mean a great deal to me. But again, on the, uh, the sheet that I put together here, um, it's useful to take what I gave earlier about the, those three, uh, three circles with the same base. So we have a personality sphere, which is the small circle, and then a larger circle will be the solar, S-O-U-L-A-R, solar sphere, and then the monadic sphere would be the largest. And if we take that, I call that the three expressions of self upon the cosmic physical plane. That's the evolution that we're talking about. That's the evolution we were talking about in Nugget One, but it's also the evolution that we learn through the teachings of theosophy and this idea of personality, soul, and monad. But what Madame Blavatsky is referring to is there is the non-evolving absolute sense, uh, self, the non-evolving absolute self. And this is often called God transcendent, whereas the other would be called God imminent. And so there is a portion of that comes out of the great unmanifest, the self that she's talking about, which doesn't evolve, but it sends same energy as I understand it, the same energy through as the Kabbalah into Kepha and then down the tree of life, which is commented upon uh, to great effect, very beautifully in the book of Revelation. Uh, so I've been reading, and of course you have those two trees there uh, that are mentioned at the beginning and the end of the Bible, the, tr the, uh, uh, the, the tree of the, um, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, um, which uh, very much uh, to do with the, uh, the whole idea of how we fell from spirit into matter, uh, from monad into physicality, and then the tree of life, which we have to link back up to. But we only link back up to it after we go through the idea uh, of these three spheres, and we have to work bottom up. We've come top down, oof, but we've got to work bottom up, and that's a lot harder because we have to fight our way back, uh, first through the first darkness, uh, and so we become illuminated, and then uh, through into the second darkness, which, of course, would be where this... Uh, second non-evolving absolute sense comes from when Madame Blavatsky in the first nugget talked about uh, light, um, the dark, this uh, uh, inner darkness being the root of light. We have to trace our way back. We are, we naturally uh, associate ourselves with the evolving self what Madame Blavatsky was reminding us, I think, in this nugget was that there, there was that uh, um, non-evolving side of us, 
which is the one boundless immutable principle, the, the one boundless immutable principle. But the evolving self, the finite self, um, participates in life, in, which is infinite, and it is that life. It is that life. So we can have these two ideas of the not self, if you like, or the, 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 the God transcendent. We're working our way through the ladder of evolution um, as the imminency uh, and uh, as the evolving self. But we are that life. And this brings in the great question of realization and something that's so important in the Eastern doctrines that we have to get to the point where we realize we are not the personality and that takes some doing because our physical body and our brain kid us that that's what's important but we only have to know that when we go to sleep at night we lose pretty much all of our identity and with consciousness then the point of consciousness which for 16 hours in the day is linked to the cortex of the brain goes off into the inner worlds it goes off temporarily if we're going to wake up the next day, but it goes off permanently into the inner worlds when we die. And so this is the Maya that is talked about in the East. But we think it's real because the brain makes us believe in we can touch, we can look, we can hear, we can see all the five gross senses. And it's the, the acuity of it is so great that we can be fooled into thinking it's reality. But we've only got to think of that sleep state or that meditative state where we close the eyes. And in closing the eyes, scientists tell us that we block out 80% of our gross sensory input with one sense, sight. We close our eyes and 80% is, is gone. So we're well on the way by just closing our eyes when we meditate uh, into those inner worlds, which we know can refresh so much. And so that leads me to the fourth and final nugget, nugget four, and it does link to nuggets one and two in particular. This is taken from probably my favourite of the three, the three uh, uh, secret doctrines, the one that Annie Besant primarily put together, um, it's credited Blavatsky Besant, of course, in the 1910 reprint on page 458, it is said, now, Mercury is called Hermes and Venus Aphrodite. And their conjunction in man on the psychophysical plane gives him the name Hermaphrodite. So, in esoteric astrology, we very much differentiate between the human soul and the Davic soul. And so the human soul is that level of consciousness which we, through five or six hundred lifetimes, will have uh, evolved our consciousness. And we will, in those later lifetimes, no doubt, have uh, got our own reservoir of Atma Bodhimanas. Atma, divine, persistent will, where not my will, but the will of something higher, the greater good has been done. Buddhi, divine compassion. Giving, it, giving out our hearts to other people and to the, the, uh, 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 the greater unconditional love that is impersonal in nature, not personal. And then manus, the ability to think about things which have nothing to do with our survival, nothing to do with the five gross senses or the world, uh, the idea uh, uh, of, of mental concepts and usually indicated not by words, which very much a brain function, but by symbol and image, which talks to the mind as opposed to the brain. And so this idea uh, of that human soul is set alongside the idea of a solar angel. Something in evolution, which is not evolving along human lines, but is evolving along, if you like, angelic lines, like devas. The way I always think about it is the devas don't take the opportunity to have form. That is the human uh, situation, the human circumstance of form, but they can link with humans. And they link with humans to help us with this second aspect of, I said to somebody at a recent talk I did, 
take away the solar angel and replace it with the Christ principle. And that's the principle of love. So however you want to see this solar angel, it's guiding us and trying to illuminate us with the idea of the impersonal love. And so it's acting as a proxy for the Christ or it's acting as an agent of the Christ, whatever. It is that love principle and it's the second principle. And again, we give these planets uh, in esoteric astrology and Mercury is the human soul and Venus is the solar angel. We know or we understand from uh, what, what I'm suggesting that up to the third initiation, Saturn limits and confines our personalities until our lessons are learned. But at the third initiation, it seems that there is the coming together, the conjunction of, the blending of the human soul, which is Mercury, and the solar angel, which is Venus. And these together form the divine hermaphrodite. And there it is in volume three of the secret doctrine, the messenger Hermes, used to have a delivery firm named after it in this country. I think they've changed their name now. Hermes, but known as the messenger and Mercury in astrology rules, the relaying of the messenger, uh, what the messenger brings, the communication of that. And um, Aphrodite, it, Venus often been linked with these perhaps more romantic and sensual ideas of love, but certainly with, with, with the love principle. And in fact, uh, the, 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 the planet itself, Venus, is heavily saturated with the second ray of love wisdom. Second ray of love wisdom, love wisely the Christ, wisdom lovingly applied the Buddha. And therefore, in both of those great avatars' lives, we can see some of the love that's been poured into humanity's uh, uh, evolution and which we should take serious note of. So the whole of this process, to me, can be put together uh, as I put together this sheet. And it's taken a while because it needs sustained periods of uh, meditation where one waits for images to be dropped into the space between thoughts. So I'm not a meditator who goes on guided meditations or affirmations. I'm a meditator who tries to create a space between thoughts and waits for the higher agency on the vertical arm of the cross to place something in that space so that I can do something with it in the outside world on the horizontal arm of the cross which is what I've been trying to do this evening. Now, I'm mindful that I'm slightly short of my hour, but uh, uh, I feel I've been quite energised in this talk and I want to just leave it at that uh, and hope that we can have some questions to, to, to fill out the time a bit more. I could elaborate on some of these aspects, but I think I've been, without the sheet, I've been uh, throwing quite a lot at you in a relatively short space of time. 